Right. Well, welcome everyone to our Voluntary Action Forum. Um, this is promises to be a really interesting one today and um, a really busy one. As you can see on your screen, there's a lot of people with us today and people still joining. So uh, what we're going to dive into is introductions first uh, and then, and that will give people who are arriving a bit of time to join us and then I'll talk about the program and we'll get going. Uh, there's a lot of people to introduce, but I'd really like to hear who you all are. So if we can be really quick, and I'm going to do the usual thing of reading down the list, but bear with me because the list jumps around. So I may get to the end of it and it may have missed over you. So when we get to the end, we'll have to shout and we'll go through all the people it's missed out. So I'll say your name uh, and then if you can just... Um, introduce yourself and where you're from and try and keep it short because there's a lot of people to introduce. So I'm going to whiz down the list and we're starting with um, Benny. Benedicta. Hi everyone. Hi, thanks Kevin. Uh, my name's Benedicta Asamra Russell. I work for Camden Council um, as Principal Policy and Products Officer, uh, co-leading the uh, disproportionate impact of COVID-19. Great. And we're going to hear a lot more from you today. Great. Okay, and Rosie? Hi, I'm Rosie Thurp, uh, also from Camden Council. I work in the community partnership team, so we work with lots of voluntary community <coughs> sector organisations. Great. Great. Zubia? Hi, Kevin. Um, it's Zubia. Um, today I'm definitely volunteer action in Camden, but at the time in Camden Council as well. Um, uh, so I work at Voluntary Action Camden as a community engagement on cultural advocacy project. Yeah, and and at the council in Prevent. Okay, yes. thanks, Zubair. Yes. Uh, Allegra. Hi, I'm Allegra Lynch. I'm the chief exec at Camden Care Centre. Um, and I've got uh, Laura. <coughs> Do you mean me? Laura Cream, yes. Hi everyone, I work at UCL. I um, head up the teams that um, do public engagement and community engagement and we work a lot with UCL's volunteering service. Great, thanks Laura. And I've got Hannah here, is that you Rafat? Yes it is, but there's two, there's two of us actually. Um, I'm Rafat, uh, Hannah Asian Women's Group, I'm the manager. And I think shortly you will be introducing my other partner in crime, and that is Rena Rani, and she's the chair. She's also here. Okay, okay, Rena. So you got two for the you. price of one. <laughs> Rena, are you are you there, Rena? I am. Yes. 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 So yes, I, as Rafat said, my um, I am the chair of Henna. Great. Welcome. Um, Anna Johnson. So this is, it's actually under the Zoom, it's under my wife's name, Anna Johnson. My name is Andy Custer. I, I live in Camden Council and I'm just interested in, you know, environmental justice issues, um, having been an environmental manager in the United States. So I just moved here not too long ago. So I'm just here just to observe and just understand what's going on in this area in the community. Ah, well, welcome. Um, Thank you. Uh, Dominic. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, quick hello. Uh, I'm Dominic from Volunteer Centre Camden. Uh, Bal. Hi, everyone. I'm Bal Baljinder here, Matiana. Um, I'm a senior strategist in the public health team working for both Islington and Camden councils. Uh, Christopher. Hello there, I'm Chris and I work at Central YMCA um, with uh, recruitment and fundraising. Great. Anna Johnson. Uh, I think you called me twice. Oh, oh it's I beg your pardon. Handy. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> sorry. sorry. I will, no problem. <laughs> I will remember that now. Um, Gaynor. One mute. Hi everybody. 
Um, Dana Humphreys. I'm a trustee of Hampstead Wells and Camden Trust, one of the small local trusts that covers part of Camden, and also on the um, Executive Committee of Voluntary Action Camden. Thanks, Gaynor. Um, Jessica. I'm hoping that's me. I don't know if there's any other Jessicas here. Um, it is you. Uh, it is me. I, I'm Jessica Lawson. I am the Prevention and Wellbeing Service Manager in Adult Social Care for Camden Council. Great. And uh, Farah, Farah Rainfly. Are you there, Farah? Yeah, Let's I'm come. Sorry, um, Farah from Life After Homeless Community Benefit Society, one of the founding directors, and we're leading on the um, emergency response at Summerstown. So we're looking after about 270 people and about 70% of our beneficiaries are BAME. Great, thanks. Um, Katya, Katya Hoover's. Hi, I'm Katya from the Advocacy Project. I am Mental Health User Involvement Coordinator. Thanks. Uh, Karen Martins. I am a community partners team member for North West London. Um, I work for Camden Council. Great. Uh, Mark. Hi, uh, I'm Mark Agathangelo. Uh, I help run a, a voluntary group for chronic pain sufferers and I also do patient partner work with uh, Camden MSK and the CCG. Thanks. Uh, Len. Are you there, Len? Get yourself off mute. Hi, I'm Len. I'm a volunteer and worker in the community sector. Um, sometimes we're back. Great. Thanks, Len. Uh, Lena. We come back to Lena. Uh, Liz Fowler. <coughs> um, hi, so I'm the support hub lead at the Royal Free Hospital. Um, it's a Royal Free charity service uh, supporting patients with long term health conditions um, that are based at the hospital. And um, part of that is a, a benefit advice team there as well. Thanks. Um, Mullet. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, this is Mulat Haragot. I'm the uh, director of Evelyn Oldfield, which works with refugee and migrant groups. Yes, so welcome, Mulat. And uh, we, we used to have do lots of things with Evelyn Oldfield, so it's nice to see you. Nice to see you here. Um, Rose Alexander. Community manager for regional space is by Warren Street Station, so we support daily services based there and about. 45 community partners who use our spaces and our resources. Yeah. That was very faint. <laughs> um, Sharon, Sharon Gordon. You're on mute, mute Sharon. Myself, okay. Hello, I'm from West Houston Partnership. I'm the director there. Thanks. Uh, Serena. Hi, everyone. Serena Loban. I'm the counter extremism coordinator um, in the community partnerships team in Camden Council. Right. Uh, Vanessa. Hi, uh, my name's Vanessa Apreshu Hancocks. I manage the Early Parenthood program and at the moment specialist bilingual family services at Manor Gardens Welfare Trust. Right. Um, Should we come back to you? Um, I think maybe, um, Kevin, can you hear us? Are you still with us? Uh, 
that you can hear us. And no, I think we may have. Uh, I think <laughs> we may the have <laughs> lost the host. Um, I was just trying to see so who was the last person who introduced themselves. Sorry, um, I was Vanessa Aparicio Hancock, and Lena is here. I, I'm not sure why she didn't speak, but she's hi. Here. Hi. Sorry, I just missed my name. Hi. Do you want to introduce yourself, then, Lena? Hi, <laughs> I'm the Arabic speaker from Elementary. Um, was everybody, did everybody manage to hear that or not? I got a bit of interference, so I didn't hear Lena very well at all. Lena, would you mind sorry, just trying again? Yeah, of course. My name is Lena Mani, a bilingual family mentor at the Early Parenthood Programme in Manor Garden Welfare Trust. Thank you. That was much clearer. Thank you. I hope everybody yeah, sorry else for got that. No, <laughs> Thanks for stepping in, Rosie. I'm, I, I dropped my connection. I disappeared. I'm back. Um, now, this is the interesting bit. So I think we're at the end of the list, but we may, we're bound to have missed someone out because the list drops around. So did anyone, was anyone not introduced? Um, so wave. Yeah. So me. I love Zinibi. I'm in the Camden Council Community Partnerships team as well and when we work with the voluntary and community services sector. Uh, um, and Donna, uh, did, have you introduced yourself? Hi, Kevin. Oh, Donna, sorry. voluntary action Camden. <laughs> oh, thanks. And Martin, I can hear Martin. Kevin, shall I introduce myself? Um, yes. Matthew Paris, Director of Health of Camden. Uh, hello, everyone. Shall I introduce myself? Please. I'm Jodie Allen. I'm the Operations Manager for Somerstown Community Association and St Pancras and Somerstown Living Centre. Great. Anyone else I missed out? Hi. Is this Hi. Sorry. Shanaz, go ahead. Yeah, Shanaz Ahmed, Bengali Workers Association, Shuma Center. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Anyone else? Yes, it's Najum Ali from Family Mentor from Manor Garden Early Parenthood Program. Uh -huh. Okay, welcome. And anyone else? Yes. Zainab, Manor Garden. Another man of God. Another God welcome. anniversary. Yeah. Children Centre. Great. Oh, Beverly. Welcome. Beverly. Anyone else? Yeah. Beverly, Beverly. go ahead. I'm the nursery um, centre manager for Manor Gardens Children Centre. A nursery. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. And anyone else? Good. Okay, well, welcome to today's meeting. And uh, today um, we're looking at AIM inequalities and COVID-19. And we're gonna hear from some work that the, the council have been doing on this issue of BAME disproportionality. Uh, we're gonna hear from Benedicta Asimel Russell from the council and Val here, Matiana from Public Health. Uh, and we're then going to have some discussions on three themes on the impact uh, on ethnic inequalities, the impact on education, and the impact on employment. Um, and then we're going to wind up uh, by 12.30. And uh, so I think without further ado, I'm going to hand over to um, Benedicta 
And now. I think I'm going to have to go inside because I know. So. Hi, hi, thanks. Kenny, over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so thank you everyone for coming uh, firstly and um, with really with this piece of work um, we have been drawing on um, pulling together key people across the council um, working with our partners um, and also a number of professionals in Camden around how we can start to pull together evidence around the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 um, so the direct impacts as well as those indirect impacts such as employment um, education um, and so really with this project at the very start so we started this around uh, six to seven weeks ago when when we're hearing uh, from public health around uh, the health disproportionate health impacts um, so we pulled together this project quite quickly to focus at on how we can work with our community to develop quick action plans and that we can embed across the council um, and very early on and something we was the um, system and how essentially this um, light on that and, and really shone a light on those deeply entrenched uh, structural inequality so really with this project what we've done is um, not only focus on on the pandemic but actually what we need to do going forward to fundamentally change the system um, and change the way um, society um, in black Asian and um, other ethnic minority communities um, and so through this process we've met weekly um, and gathered information uh, so both lived experience and uh, um, quantitative data to really um, uh, build together a rich picture of the impacts of our community so that we can have an evidence-based action plan um, and so we we are starting to wrap up that uh, rapid process um, and finalize those action plans and we're really um, looking at now meeting with um, a lot more of our uh, VCS sector to help shape those uh, plans better and also thinking about how we uh, continue to participate with our residents to co-design, co-deliver some of those plans and um, so I'll just hand over to Bao to, to give a bit more information on that participation element. Thanks Benny. Um, so we seem to have lost the slides. Uh, oh okay, the back. <laughs> um, Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to add to um, what Benny's been saying, um, we, we really wanted to make sure we involved all our key stakeholders in this process. So it's not just about us sitting around in a room and looking at what the evidence is, but actually listening to um, our residents, listening to VCS organisations and to other partners. So right from the beginning, we actively engaged with our VCS partners to submit uh, information about what they we're seeing and hearing from the communities and residents they work with about the lived experience of our residents. Um, and then during this process, so as um, Benny said, we each week focused on a different theme. And for each of those themes, we um, did invite um, some selected stakeholders. So for example, for the health discussion, we had some senior GPs from the CCG come along um, and talked about some of the things that they were hearing in terms of primary care practice, but also what they were hearing about use of um, A&E departments and, and other kind of broader NHS services. We also had Healthwatch come along um, and talk about some of the findings from the they were doing. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm not going to talk about that whole process too much. Um, but maybe if we go on to the next slide. So the next steps, um, just about this work, I mean, I'll quickly wrap that up actually, just that uh, there's an interim report coming out this week. There will be a full report coming out, um, hopefully in the next few weeks, 
um, that doesn't mean that this work is stopping. It's actually going to be embedded in um, the work that we're doing in different departments. Um, it will still be um, led by senior members, um, elected members from, from the council. So part of that working group, we had senior representation. So we had the chief executive on, on the group. We had the leader of the council. We had um, a number of cabinet members on the group um, and uh, executive directors as well from the council. So that uh, senior level um, leadership will continue with the work going forward. Should I pause there before I start talking about the health impact or shall I just kick off with that? Okay, so I'm going to just kick off with them in talking about the, the health impact of COVID-19. Um, I'm sure most of you are probably quite familiar with some of these um, statistics and the evidence that's emerging. I'll just quickly summarise. Um, so in Camden, we actually have a, um, a COVID-19 mortality rate, which has been age standardised, which is significantly lower than the London average. Um, so that's quite uh, surprising and interesting. Um, and it has one of the lowest mortality rates amongst all London boroughs. But we are, however, seeing other health and well-being impacts. And so it's important not to be complacent about this. Um, and we are seeing, so I don't actually have the data in here about the local, so very recently, so only um, in the last few days, we've had the intelligence team in public health um, release some new analysis that they've done of hospital admissions locally um, and the breakdown of those by ethnicity. And actually we're seeing very similar picture at the local level of what the national data is showing. So we are seeing higher rates in certain groups, for example, the Bangladeshi group, twice the risk of um, death than the white British ethnicity, and then also higher risk in those other ethnic groups. Um, we've also got um, higher prevalence of some long-term conditions, and that's really important because those conditions increase the clinical vulnerability to COVID-19. So conditions like diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and high blood pressure, um, the evidence of that those four are really um, quite important in terms of the impact of COVID-19. Um, so moving on to the next slides. Thank you. Um, so like I mentioned before, we do know that there has been at a local level and obviously a national level, a decrease in the numbers of people accessing NHS services and that's really worrying because we know that people aren't accessing it when they really need to, for example when they're having a stroke or a heart attack, but people aren't going to A&E, um, which is um, obviously a massive issue. And we also know that people aren't able to access um, other key services like mental health for example. And then also there's an ongoing issue around people's experience of using services and not feeling um, welcome or that it's um, culturally competent for them. So there was a report that we produced last year which looked at health inequalities and there was some evidence in there, local evidence from um, our health watch organisations in Camden and Islington which talked about the discriminatory treatment um, that people experienced um, which really shaped their experience of using health services. Um, and there's national research to show that actually that everyday discrimination, whether it's actually real, but also the fear of it, is very closely associated to poor health and well-being outcomes. So there is a very clear link between health and um, discrimination. And then just on the last point, I think it's really important not to make assumptions about people. So this um, ONS data actually quite surprised me, um, which is around digital exclusion. So this is quite relatively recent, 2018, and they found that actually uh, the number of internet non-users was lower in um, the Bangladeshi population than there was in the um, uh, um, overall figure for the UK. So I thought that was quite interesting that we are seeing different trends um, and that we should on a regular basis check how things are changing with, with our populations. Um, and then just moving on um, the next slide please. Thank you. So um, very quickly, just talking about physical activity and also mental health and well-being. We know that obesity is a really key risk factor for severe illness and death from COVID-19. Um, so it's really important that we do focus on this. Um, and actually local data does show that some um, ethnic groups are locally, so this is local data, are more likely to be overweight or obese. Um, uh, what else do I want to say about that? 
so I don't need to go into all of that. But I'm um, just thinking about to mental health, that we know that um, some of our uh, Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities in Camden have um, for many years had poorer mental health and we've seen quite um, uh, stark uh, inequalities around that. So um, it's really important we continue to focus on that. Early findings from the Health Watch resident survey shown that um, <coughs> excuse me, mental health is really emerging as uh, an important impact of COVID-19. Um, so it is important that we do continue to focus on that and make sure we're putting things in place quite quickly, but also over the long term as the impact um, continues over a number of months. Okay, so just the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the population um, of Camden that um, comes from a black, Asian or minority ethnic group is estimated to be about 34%. That is quite old data, so it's from the 2011 census data, but that's the only um, real data that we've got. Um, so that data, it, it might be from the census data, but then it is estimated by the GLA about what it would be today. Um, so it's about 34%. Our largest communities are Bangladeshi, Somali, other Black African, other Asian and Chinese. So we do have a very diverse community um, in Camden. And one of the key things I think to note about the health impact of um, this pandemic is that it's not about the pandemic creating new inequalities. What it's really done is shone a light on those existing deeply um, entrenched health inequalities that have been around for a long time. And these are around the social, economic and cultural and environmental determinants of health. So working across the system to really try and um, make a difference here. Um, and just make, making a note of as well that we need to focus on the vulnerability as well as exposure. So how do we reduce that exposure to the virus, but then also try and um, build resilience for people less vulnerable to it. So by focusing on those underlying health conditions I talked about before. Um, and just the last point there really about that we know our communities are not um, homo homogenous groups that even within um, our particular ethnic communities there's great diversity um, and there's lots of strengths and assets there that we need to build on and recognise um, and acknowledge. So that's really key in the work that we do. I'm going to very quickly just talk through about some of the things we've started to deliver. Um, so working with colleagues across the council and the system getting the right public health advice out there to people in a range of different accessible formats to make sure we get the information to the people who um, find it hardest to get um, the most accurate and up-to-date information. So we're working with different um, partners around that. Developing and implementing the testing and contact tracing system, so that's at a local level, which is really important if we want to try and prevent um, a second wave. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about what's been happening in Leicester um, and you know if we'd got if they had had the data around the testing quickly they would have been able to prevent um, the cases getting so high so that's really important um, we're doing lots and lots of data analysis as we get more and more information through the NHS about diagnosis and deaths we're doing the analysis we can make sure that then informs our response going forward but also over the long term um, I'm not going to go through all of these bullet points because I know we are um, short for time, but we are working with partners to develop um, and implement an individual staff risk assessment. So that's across the council, but it could be rolled out broader. Um, making sure we have the ongoing dialogue with our different communities and residents uh, about what information they need, about some of the myth busting, about alleviating some of the anxiety that's out there. Um, and just go on to the next slide. Um, sorry, who's got the, uh, thank you. Um, so we're working with Healthwatch Camden as well to really promote their online survey, but also to do um, some focus groups with some key at-risk communities to get a better understanding of what are the support needs and the issues and priorities and concerns for different groups because they are not the same for everybody. Um, we're looking at digital exclusion um, and one of the key things I'd just like to raise lastly is about mental health which is um, we've always had mental health awareness training available for all our residents and workers in the borough um, so we had mental health first aid training and we've had mental health awareness one of the first things we did after lockdown was get those um, trainings into a virtual format um, they are available and we're actively promoting those and I really encourage people 
to sign up and do those courses really really fantastic if they haven't already done those um, and also getting the information out to people about those um, mental health services that have also changed their operating models to make them much more accessible during this um, current time. So I think I'm going to stop there. I don't think I've got any further slides. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll stop there. Um, I'm sorry, Kim, I can't remember whether we're taking questions now or we're going to be taking them all at the end in a discussion. Um, I think let's let's um, let's dive into the next part, which um, is the group dis the the, the um, these guided group discussions, uh, and then um, let's take any um, sort of points that haven't been covered right right at the end. So um, let me hand back uh, for the, the the group discussions. Um, and then let me just say to everyone that uh, there, is a, there are a lot of us on the call. Um, there is chat. So if you don't get a chance to um, have your say, then do put your, um, do put your comments in the chat and that, that will be recorded um, and picked up as well. So um, Benny and Bal, you're going to go through three different areas. Um, the health impact and ethnic inequalities, education and educational impact, and employment and economic impact. So let me hand back, and should we start on the health impact and ethnic inequalities? Uh, Bal or Benny, I'm not sure which one of you is leading on that one. Um, so Kevin, I just went through um, those health inequalities. I've just I've quickly just summarized what the evidence shows us. Um, and how we then turn that evidence into action and um, some of the key things we've put into place. Um, I don't know, was everyone able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to pass on to then um, Benny to talk about um, the, the next section. Hi, so um, I think what we wanted to do was um, maybe have a bit of a group discussion so some reflections on those session if that's still okay um, so we really wanted to hear from people if um, they agree with the evidence that's been shared um, and whether there's anything in particular that you think we need to add that hasn't been reflected from a health inequalities perspective um, but we're also keen to uh, for you all to help shape the action plan. So if there are any suggestions on uh, one thing that um, you think would make the most difference um, in our action planning, we're really keen to hear from people. Um, so uh, maybe a mix of the chat bar and if uh, people want to raise their hands, it, it would be great to hear from you. Would you like to uh, go first? So you have to wave at me or shout at me. We have Farah, it looks like, has her hand up. Thanks. Um, one of, it's sort of more of a practical thing. As I mentioned, we're in Summers Town, we're looking after 270 going on to 280 people per week now with food parcels and 70% of them are BAME. And actually it's interesting because our highest proportion is Bengali and Somali. One of the things I raised very early on in the pandemic is we needed access to vitamin D. We took it to Public Health, Camden and Islington. They came back and said they were doing a, a consultation. We said, that's great, but we need access to it now. And obviously looked forward to that, those details. Um, we did manage to get a month and a half supply um, uh, donated, but that's run out already. So that's one thing I want to raise is it's there is there. Obviously, I've read the findings on COVID-19 
and um, vitamin D. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that people have been staying inside their homes. Um, the majority, the people who receive our food parcels, two thirds are delivered by volunteer drivers. They cannot get out They, for multiple reasons. And there is a real need for vitamin D. Okay, thanks for that, Farah. Should we take a couple of points and then and then come back to um, Benny and Bao? So, Rena, you had your hand up. Um, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. This is a question for um, Bao. There is, um, you mentioned that with digital exclusion, the Bangladeshi group or community were most affected. Um, I was wondering whether you'd splice that by gender. So, is it? more women? Is it more men? And also, have you looked at it by age? So is it younger adults? Is it older adults? Because it's too broad to just talk about the community as a whole. If we were going to have any effective strategies as an organisation, we'd need to know who to target. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rena. And should we take another point and then go back to Bal and Okay, uh, anyone raising Shanaz? Oh, I've got Shanaz, and is that um... Shanaz? Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I just unmuted myself. Um, so I work with, I, I work as, you know, I work um, for Bengali Workers Association, and I work with mostly older people. And the question you've just asked, it's 99% of my members, because they're elderly, they're not able to use, you know, they don't get access to internet or they don't know how to use internet. So I am actually struggling. We, instead of using, uh, when I'm passing on information, I can't send them an email. I have to make phone calls one by one. And they're, they're not accessing information, they're not getting, so we have to create kind of group chat. They're not even able to use WhatsApp or type. So I have to ask them to leave voice messages. Not everyone is able to do that because they don't know how to use smartphones and they're really struggling. Also accessing services uh, because of COVID-19, the GP surgeries and other places, you know, there is, uh, you have to book appointments online or you have to, there's something called Dr. IQ and stuff like that, that, you know, you don't, they don't have face-to-face -face appointments. They have to do things online and they struggle. Also with telephone calls, because of the language barrier, they are not, you know, when they call, they struggle to make an appointment. So that's why we come in, we try to do as much as we can. But I was quite shocked at a decision that was made by CCG, I think yesterday without any notice. Um, as you know, there's a larger number of um, Bangladeshi community living in Somerstown and some of the areas like Queen's Crescent, near Queen's Crescent surgeries and places like that. So what the surgeries did previously, they would have an interpreter on it, on like once a week or twice a week or some, some days of a fixed time that, that those Bengali elderly, they know that that's when they can call, they can make appointment, they can discuss stuff and they can come in. But I think without any notice yesterday, CCG has decided to take all the sessions off. And I think that would cause a really big problem because they're, they're really afraid to Go, go out and obviously then they can't go out because they're elderly, they're shielding. So if they don't have the access to the services, that's going to be really problematic and I think they will suffer really highly because I'm making, um, each day I'm making 30, 40 calls, there's no day and night because obviously phone call takes longer <laughs> than any other. So the people who are working with the community, we know the effect, but I, I think um, that decision that CCG had made that needs to be looked into because they, they will really suffer significantly because of that. Okay, Shanaz, thanks for that. So we've got three points. Now, Rafat, I'll come back to you. Um, let's, let's take these ones back um, for Bal and Benny to, to discuss. We've got a, a number of points there, a range of things uh, from everything from vitamin D to this issue of digital exclusion, um, decisions about interpreters, uh, it's a range of things. By the way, um, we're, uh, we're recording this, um, and I hope that's okay. Uh, if not, 
do switch your camera off and we're it's so that we can also record the chat because we want to not miss out anything so if there's anything you don't get a chance to say then do put it in the chat as well so let me um ask um benny and val to address those three uh and then we'll come back to the next set of three questions starting with rafax okay thank you very much um those are really interesting questions so thank you for those um, i'm going to work backwards so i'll start with um Shinaz's question um about sort of those communications um and actually that links in with arena's question as well um, we, we know that we have to use obviously a range of different channels for communicating with our residents. One size does not fit all. Um, and we are looking at, I mean, right from the beginning, we have um, worked with our communications team, our BCS organisations, looking at how we do that. There's been lots of national resources that um, we've been trying to utilise as well. Um, but a couple of things just to highlight that we've implemented uh, or are implementing at the moment. So one thing that maybe um, Rosie could provide more information about as well is this um, group we've pulled together of VCS organisations that work primarily with black, Asian and minor minority ethnic groups. Um, and the idea of this um, sort of working group is to focus really on communications and engagement. How do we get the right communications out to the right people in the right format? Um, in a timely way, um, but also kind of picking up, so it's about having a two-way dialogue, so about picking up what are the key emerging issues that, that we need to address. So I think that's going to really help with that point. Um, and then also um, at the Health and Wellbeing Board last week, I think there was a conversation um, with senior members across the system about developing up a task and finish group at a local level to try and join up some of our communications, so particularly focusing around health and schools. So, um, and so the, the idea was there'd be representation from the CCG, uh, Health Watch, uh, VCS organisations and Camden Council, um, and that we try and do some joint work together rather than duplicating efforts. Um, and that's in the process of being set up, so hopefully that can um, feed into that. But it'd be great to get your, your ongoing input into those activities. Um, the point about the digital exclusion and that um, the ONS report that I mentioned, um, so that was national data, so that's not local data, but the reason why I wanted to highlight it is because I feel quite often we make assumptions about our residents and about our different communities, about how people want to be communicated with, and actually we shouldn't make those assumptions, um, mm -hmm. and, we do, and we do need more um, evidence about how people want to receive information um, so, um, in terms of the breakdown of that, um, of, of those findings, um, I, sorry, it's quite a while ago that I looked at that report, so I can't recall whether that was there. But even if there was, I mean, I think it's, it's not directly applicable to our work, it's just um, something just to kind of note, really. Um, and then the third point, which was around vitamin D. So, yes, we, I mean, we don't really know yet what the relationship is between vitamin D and um, COVID-19. Um, but your point about obviously people staying at home does exacerbate that um, um, vitamin D deficiency if they do already have it. Um, and I think we do need to probably get some more information out to people about natural sources of vitamin D, so food and trying to um, increase access to sunlight. But yeah, um, I can look into that point about the vitamin D supplements and um, who was giving it. So maybe if I, you and I can have a conversation about that offline. Okay, thanks. Now I had um, uh, Rafat and Lena um, next. So, uh, Rafat, what was your question? And you need to let me unmute you. Right, there we go. Uh, it's just a few points. Uh, I think Val's just uh, made a few of them clear anyway. Uh, but it was uh, firstly starting with who are the actual partners that the public health team are working with to relay uh, information and accessibility to users. I know she's mentioned the VCS, Camden Council, Health Watch. I want to know, is there any uh, local intelligence used? And I'll, when I'm talking about local intelligence, I'm talking about grassroots charities that actually are on the front line that are working with uh, the users that actually do have, uh, well, the best idea of what residents need. Um, 
you know, this kind of issue was taken to senior leads and counsellors at Camden Council. But unfortunately, that was a few weeks ago and no one's actually got back to us. So as a BAME organisation, we do feel extremely demotivated when it comes to uh, relaying information or local intelligence that we picked up uh, only to be ignored. Um, um, and it's, it's obviously, once again, it's just the normal routine that BAME organisations have kind of got used to, unfortunately. Um, so now, uh, yes, it is COVID-19. Yes, BAME users are obviously placed at high risk. And yes, I do understand that we are using national data, but it doesn't come anything close to what the real data actually is. Um, to pick up census from 2011, that just doesn't make sense. We're, we're in 2020 right now. We are facing COVID-19. We have high risk individuals that come from BAME communities. It is about time that we sat down on a round table to actually sit down with grassroots charities to discuss these matters because we are the ones that are providing the, 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 the right information, like even the whole digital inclusive um, inclusivity for the BAME users. You know, we've been able to give out our, our, our tablets to many, many BAME users we've thought about all the barriers that might come across these individuals that are accessing these services and I've got 70 all elderly Asian women that are accessing services online with tablets once again it was the fact that you know we went to the people rather than the people expected to come to us so that's one point when it comes to working with a population um, that lacks accessibility but yeah it's just a really good idea to understand that yes we have Camden Council there yes we have PhD the public health uh, from Camden and Islington and we just want to know how we are going to move forward because I've been in many consultations where I've sat with GPs, Dan Beck actually, uh, from the GP consortium and um, the, for years I've tried to uh, build a relationship with GP surgeries but once again we do get pushed in the corner, we are ignored and unfortunately um, um, this is quite concerning because now we are going to go, like, open our doors eventually in September but how are we going to move forward with this? What type of information is going to be given to us? And it's okay, we, we're getting surveys from main key agencies, but when will we actually get a voice? Thank you. Great, thanks, Rafat. Um, now, uh, let's take a couple of questions and then, and then come back. So, Lena, you're, you've got your hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, as a bilingual uh, maternity mentor or family mentor working with BAME minorities and other ethnicities. Uh, we uh, would like to know what uh, uh, action has been made for educational, uh, in terms of education for uh, uh, families who has no English and uh, they are struggling uh, financially, uh, extreme struggle in terms to find, to have a laptop or devices to educate their children and the school, they are putting a huge pressure on the families in general during this epidemic. But uh, uh, I'm not sure it has been given the opportunity to these families uh, uh, or the, the enough support for them to help them to support them, supporting their children in education and any other further plan in the future to take in consideration the, the education needs for both adults who are struggling to support their children and the child. Join, uh, my point is arrived. With the same family, they have a huge struggle in education. Yeah, I think I think Lena, we've yeah, we've you've made your and point. The schools are not very supportive. Who are in Camden? They were nothing has been provided. Uh, nothing. Uh, so I would like to know if there is in the educational system any further update. Okay, thank thank you, thank you Lena. And should we take one more? Um, uh, Rena, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, just following up on a point that um, I was going to raise initially um, uh, with something that I think it was uh, raised at the beginning of the PowerPoint about the intensive work being done for change. And uh, I wondered whether the, whether the recommendations in this report would be any different to recommendations that should have been made 
um, previously because health inequalities have existed for decades. This is nothing new. So uh, that'd be really interesting and to be able to have that report disseminated so that all grassroots charities can actually pick it up and do something with it rather than having it somewhere where we have to go and make effort to get access to the report. Uh, and then pulling up on a point that Rafa has just made that um, I'm not sure, again, using old data from the syndex, I'm not sure if um, it's appreciated that there are only 10% of services and organisations in Camden that serve BAME individuals living in the area. So to not even speak to those 10% of agencies is, um, you know, it, it, I mean, it would, it would make the job very difficult. I think recommendations would be very difficult okay if not consulted with even the 10 percent that are actually dealing with the 34 percent of the population thank you great okay thank you for those three questions um bal how do you want to respond um thank you uh, again some really important points made there um so just around um, so Rafat's question around local intelligence, um, um, actually all three points were very similar really about using local intelligence and involving local organisations. Very, yeah, completely agree, incredibly important. It's not just around what data tells us. Um, and also we do do a local um, data analysis as well. So we have GP data that we analyse as well. Um, but um, so we, like I mentioned, there's a couple of different forums for gathering that local intelligence about either lived experience for residents, but also what VCS, um, small VCS organisations are seeing as well as the bigger VCS organisations. Um, and like I say, a couple of my colleagues can probably talk a little bit more about that. So Rosie and um, Benny might just say a little bit more. But I know that I think next week there's going to be the launch of um, some common the website called The Common Place um, on Camden Council's website where we'll be asking residents and VCS organisations to contribute um, intelligence of what they're hearing and seeing out there. Um, and I mean, that empowerment of our local VCS organisations and active participation is really key to everything that Camden Council does. It's, it's you know, it was core to um, the Camden 2025 work and the new Camden plan um, so I would reiterate that we, we really do want to hear from those organisations and I mean forums like this are really important um, and I know that um, the VCS team, so Rosie's team, um, have been putting on, putting on lots of other events as well like this. Um, and just about Rena's point around inequalities, again I'd say that's also at the heart of everything we do and the heart of um, our vision as a, as a council. Um, to tackle that social injustice that we see in our um, communities. Um, so like I mentioned, the report that we did last year around tackling health inequalities that public health did, it actually showed some really good progress as well that we'd made. For example, diabetes in our black community um, has now stayed, well, the, the control of diabetes had improved since previous years. Um, and my concern is that something, something like COVID is, might put some of that success back a bit and we actually need to really focus on how do we maintain um, some of those successes that we have made in recent years. Um, so and I'm, I'm conscious of time so I don't want to go, go on too much um, but just about Lena's point around education I'm not going to preempt um, uh, Benny, Benny's slides so she's going to be talking about this in a moment um, so I'll let her kind of answer that point. I hope that's um, helped but I don't know if Rosie or Benny you want to add anything to those, to those points? Yeah, um, thanks, Bao. And I just wanted to reiterate uh, some of what you said, but also reflecting on the different styles of participation that we need to put in place and really um, coming to this group and having this sort of forum um, is the first step with that. And we really want to take forward the, um, some of the actions and help to shape the plan that we, we do publish based on this discussion. And um, so really making sure that part of our recommendations can be that we need to go further to uh, work directly with our grassroots organisation. And we hope as part of this process, this intensive process, that we're starting to do that. So for example, with the communications working group that was mentioned, where that's um, definitely an invite to anyone that does want to join that and help us to shape what are the most important um, 
communications that we need to ensure are available to our communities. Um, but also we're thinking about how we can set up um, some resident panels, for example, and specifically looking at having um, a diverse range of uh, voluntary sector organisations as well as residents who can um, be critical friends to, to the council, but also work in partnership with us to co-deliver for some of those action plans and thinking about how we can make sure we work together collaboratively to ensure that we do tackle these structural inequalities and help to change some of um, the services and the way that they're delivered to, to different groups. So definitely this is the start of the process and uh, really open to hearing ideas on how we can continue to maintain these discussions and make sure that um, we, we do share those uh, across the council um, and, and embed change in how we, we participate with people. Um, and uh, as Val mentioned, I'll come back to the education point um, with, uh, with the slides on, on schools and, and young people. Do you, I, I don't, I know we're quite short on time. I'm happy to just post some stuff in the chat, Kevin, or just- Yes, uh, Penny, should we carry on now with your next part? Yeah. Um, Rosie, are you okay to pop the slides back up? Yeah, sure. I'll post some updates in the chat after the slides. Okay. <laughs> And so just to give a bit of an intro, um, we have been, um, so as part of this process, uh, we touched on that we've had uh, five key themes, uh, six key themes, sorry, and one of them has been education and young people. And so if we want to go on to the first slide, uh, Rosie, um, where we have pulled together some of the, the uh, most up-to-date uh, data from our school census um, and where we've identified that um, half of all learners in Camden are from black and um, min minority ethnic groups and um, so this is significant compared to the national average so recognizing this is really important in how we tailor the way we um, deliver our, our learning to, to young people in Camden um, is going to be a really important um, and fundamental part of our action plan going forward um, and also another point that I really wanted to draw on here which I think Lena touched on as well um, is that there are 163 languages and dialects spoken in Camden schools um, and there's a significantly high proportion of children who speak English as an additional language and um, so that's 56% in primary schools um, and 43% in secondary schools so that's significantly higher than, than the national average um, so we're definitely recognising that information and thinking about how we can tailor our approach to um, homeschooling as a result of that and make sure we do take that neighbourhood's approach to doing that. Um, Rosie, if we could go on to the next slide, um, uh, where we really have touched on attainment for young people in, in Camden and how we're seeing that in Key Stage 2, a large proportion of our Black other children are um, performing below at below average um, and then at key stage four we're seeing a large proportion of Caribbean children uh, performing below below the average of their their counterparts um, and what we also find is that um, Somali students in particular um, they perform in line with their counterparts at key stage two but by key stage four we're finding that actually they are slightly below the national average so there's really something about those disparities in different groups that we're, we're hearing about and really needing to take a tailored approach um, in order to address that um, and so with this process as well as apart from this evidence that we're seeing so just touching on some of the points that were made that um some of this information is um historic that we've known for a long time but with this process we've really um tried to talk to um our voluntary sector groups to get some of that more rich up-to-date information about why this is happening so it's not just about that that data that those um quantitative data it's about that lived experience as well and we're hearing in particular of 
our Somali VCS, how um, a lot of families uh, live in overcrowded households and may have to share laptops with, with siblings um, or school-aged children are finding it harder to find space in the home to um, study. So uh, we, we need to think about how we embed this in our action plan, how we support um, families at an early stage. So um, linking in with our housing colleagues, our neighbourhood officers in order to, to address that is going to be really key and also really key on the digital divide, which I'll, I'll touch on shortly. Um, just some more lived experience that we're hearing has been around um, the Somali and Bangladeshi community and how there's fears of uh, returning to school because actually living at home with um, maybe older relatives in multi-generational housing um, is causing some anxiety uh, with uh, parents wanting to send their children back to school um, and then also just really quickly touching on um, how unconscious bias has been a real concern for parents parents and how um, the, the changes to uh, grading grading uh, young people's um, exams this year has been based on predicted grades and we know that evidence has shown that um, black and Asian and other ethnic minority children tend to be uh, tend to get lower predicted grades so and um, these are some of the anxieties that we're really hearing on the ground and um, starting to think about what we need to do what we need to put in place to address this uh, Rosie if we can move on to the next slide um, and so just to touch on some of the things that we're starting to do in um, Camden Learning and in partnership with schools um, we're definitely taking a tailored approach to homeschooling so responding to, to needs and um, ident identifying needs and responding to those needs on a school by school basis so really hearing about what parents are telling teachers firsthand and how we can ensure that homeschooling is um, tailored appropriately so um, this is one of the points that we definitely need to take back to our Camden Learning colleagues as well around um, parents who may not speak English as a first language, how are we providing extra support as Camden Learning to, to ensure that uh, children are able to access as much of the education materials as possible and have, have enough support to, to, um, to, to um, undertake un uh, homeschooling. So really important point that we're definitely going to take back. Um, if we move on to the next slide with uh, the digital divide, um, we've received over a thousand devices from the DfE um, and so uh, with this we've prioritised um, ch looked after children um, and ensuring that the most disadvantaged children have access to laptops um, and also Wi-Fi um, as of course access to Wi-Fi is also an issue. Um, um, and now we're starting to look at how we can ensure that we prioritise the next phase of young people and um, who may not have access to laptops. So as part of this, um, this piece of work is definitely feeding into this. And we've been really um, clear about sharing this evidence and saying, actually, we know that our black, Asian and other ethnic minority um, young people are going to be well are disproportionately affected so how can we um, prioritize them in rolling out some of those that equipment in this next phase and as we go through the summer and into the the new um, school year um, so we're also working on that um, if we move on to the next slide um, we've also touched on um, the the assessments and the concerns around um, uh, those predicted gradings. So uh, Camden did respond to the off off call uh, consultation and raise that this is a that this is a concern and we we have facts and figures that show that uh, uh, young black children in particular have been um, uh, received um, predicted grades that are lower than their counterparts. So really thinking about how. Um, people um, that are re reviewing those predicted grades are uh, taking equalities assessments and taking this into account when they give the final grades to young people. Um, so yeah, we're, re we're really um, tackling this head on and also working on how we can um, embed um, anti-racist materials for schools. So uh, a lot of uh, resources have been distributed to, to schools around Camden and they've also um, led pulling together some 
resources and uh, sharing this with parents as well as um, teachers um, in light of the Black Lives Matter movement. So just really picking up on those, um, what's been happening over the last few weeks and making sure that that is embedded in um, how we um, uh, address schooling going forward. Um, and then one other thing that I did want to touch on is that transition period for young people. So of course, we um, I'll, I'll touch on employment in a bit more detail later, um, but we know that young people, um, once they come out of school, are 54% more likely to be un unemployed than their white counterparts. And um, so we're really um, working on ways to tackle this. So one example of that is a virtual work experience programme, because we know that there's the risk of um, uh, young BAME, uh, young BAME um, people falling even further behind. So how can we ensure that they have access to to those employment opportunities at an early stage um, so so that's a summary of um, some of the work that's already started um, and then as the slides show where also we've also heard about um, mental health needs so um, a, a report uh, came out recently which uh, came from information from Cooth which is an online um, mental health uh, charity that supports young people and it found that um, uh, BAME children are much more likely to access their their services during this time. So the school are very much schools are very much now tailoring their advice and providing guidance to parents and pupils around mental health and ensuring that they are supported and that there is tailored support around that. Uh, so I will stop there. Um, and uh, if people have any questions, and that would be great. It would be great to hear from you. Okay, so we've got um, time for a few questions now um, before we do the, the last section. So Rafat, you were very, you were first off the mark, so fire away. Yeah, it's just a quick one. Um, right, so we're talking about tackling inequalities at the report that was derived last year. Um, since then, can the council give me an understanding of how many BAME organisations have actually been commissioned from Camden itself? If we're talking about tackling inequalities, how many BAME organisations have actually been commissioned by the council to assist in this uh, piece of work? Okay. Um, that was a quick question. Should we it is. Um, obviously, I'm not talking about pocket funding. I'm talking about long-term commissioning work. Because we're all used to, as BAME organisations, getting pocket funding. Or like, for instance, Camden only gave us some funding uh, for a befriending project, and that was over around about seven years ago. Um, so this is something I've always wanted to know. Which BAME organisations get commissioned um, from the council, and how do they push forward? Uh, I'm not sure if um, Benny or Bell would have that, that answer, actually. But, that I mean, would be something you... that would be quite interesting to actually find out because if we are now going into uh, getting organizations and obviously uh, many different VCS organizations ready to bring on people uh, once obviously lockdown is uh, properly you know out and of the way um, I want to know who will be commissioned and how we can work forward because many organizations now are facing financial crisis because we've had to use a lot of our money out of our own funds to uh, provide to users but how is the council now going to step into commission organisations to work now further, um, making sure that prevention means are, are put into place? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rafid. I don't know if there are any, um, I don't know if Benny or Bal or any of the community partners would, would be able to answer, answer that, that at this yeah. stage. Um, does anyone want to take a stab or? <laughs> There's not there's not a um, an overall kind of figure or, or number that I I could give you, Rafa. Um, well, I know yeah. a few people have uh, have said in the chat that we would like to know the answer to that too. I mean, to be honest, we've we've spent quite a long time in our our team trying to find out just actually which different parts of the council fund which parts of the the VCS and building that picture in yeah, itself is, is really more the, problematic the, than you. No, definitely because this is now something that, you know, obviously you have Ballon mentioned that the discriminatory experiences of users accessing services, 
but we now as organizations we're like okay there's discriminatory experiences of when the council comes to commission what well, give us work they don't we we get ignored so this is something now that maybe it should be up for conversation because we are facing COVID-19 we're, we're coming out of our lockdown our services will reopen but who's going to support us because we're doing a lot of the work <laughs> and that's always the case yeah. and the, the, you know obviously there's loads of funding around we know that there's money councils do have money because they put it into their own personal reserves and, and Camden's very good at actually saving their money which is given from central government but where does that money go when it comes to commissioning work? Who is commissioned? What, which, which side of the borough is actually getting the money? Because that is something that the part that we're actually based in, we don't get nothing. Um, so, you know, it, it is up for conversation. I would actually prefer if this was taken to certain councillors, uh, because I myself have actually tried to contact many leads and senior councillors in Camden Council to directly ask this question. But once again, ignored. Um, which is extremely but, pathetic, uh, but yeah, uh, unfortunately, so, I mean, is... that Rafa, I mean, that reiterates what um, a, you know. A few of the organisations that contributed to the kind of get ed evidence gathering stage yeah. of this piece of work, which was, you know, it was quite a kind of quick turnaround on this, and there wasn't a huge amount of organisations that were able to kind of contribute at that stage, and that's why we sort of wanted to work with VAC to kind of carry on the discussion around this. Um, but that was a point that was made by a lot of organisations was about around the fair distribution of, of funding. Yeah. Yes. So I mean, there's a couple of things that have happened since then. So um, we contributed a bit to Cams and Givings COVID-19 fund. So the council's contributed to £150. £5,000 is not enough to work. Five no, no, I know. I appreciate it's that. But I was just and as a BAME organisation, we were not given the money from Camden Giving. What, so, so what I was again. just going to what I was just going to say, Rafa, was that um, in the second round of funding that Camden Giving ran, they had a specific criteria around supporting organisations that are working with BAME communities, and there were twenty applications that were received under that theme and all of those organizations were awarded funding and that was based on some of the evidence and feedback that we'd received um, from organizations that was then shared with their resident making panel mm -hmm. um, who were then sort of able to make that decision about funding in terms of some of the local still um, funding the local community infrastructure levy that's one of the things that has kind of been approved by local councillors as well as where you're working with BAME communities can you be prioritised for local SIL funding so that so the council's been looking at how SIL funding can be used to um, support COVID-19 responses I mean in terms of kind of wider support for the sector that's been looked at at the moment I mean the thing that I would say is that there is always um, never going to be enough money for what is needed in both in the sector and and in communities I think it's really right to kind of challenge and raise the point and actually ask the question about who's being commissioned how much and how are those decisions being made and I think that that has kind of come out of some of the recommendations in terms of their monitoring and reporting around that mm. um, but I think um, in terms of the kind of you know the engagement and hearing from organizations that's why, you know, with Bao and Benny and others working on this, we were really keen to kind of bring it into the more of the VCS forum, you know, and working with the sort of wider range of groups, which is not just the organisations that we necessarily have a direct funding relationship with. Yes, um, yes. And thank you very much narrow. for actually doing this as well, because as I said, if we can't get through to the council, you know, it is the VCSs that we too tend to lean back on. And I can see that the chat is going crazy right now because it's obviously bringing in that we weren't supported, we weren't giving the funding from Camden Giving. And the thing is, I would obviously put this down to pocket funding because it's so, the pocket funding that, that is quite offensive for many organisations is when they're giving it, they're not giving a commission funding. I'm, but thank you very much, Rosie. Thank you very much for yeah. letting us you know, shed some light in that area. Thank you. Yeah, clearly this has really touched a nerve um, and this is a, this is a big issue. Um, and um, sorry kevin i've just literally revolted the whole group haven't i i've started a revolution <laughs> you started the revolution <laughs> well it was very quiet it was too quiet to begin with we needed yes. someone to start the revolution well there you are kevin <laughs> <laughs> um i'm conscious we've still got one more section so should we do the final section um and then um and then we will summarize um Do we have more? So, yeah. Rosie, do you mind popping up the slides? Thank you. 
Um, so the last section was just touching on employment. Uh, so I'll touch on it really, really quickly um, because again, we're happy to, we're, we're keen to hear from you on this and ensure that um, we have the right information and that we can ensure that the action plans that that we do publish in this report are reflective of all of these uh, conversations. And just like um, Rafat has just raised, it's really important that we acknowledge what has just been raised and be really clear about what our commitment is going to be going forward. So we will take that back um, and discuss discuss that uh, with, with colleagues. Um, so just to re really quickly touch on um, employment and the labour market. So the figures again are showing how this um, this pandemic has really sh shone the light on on the disproportionalities. So from January to March, we saw that uh, six percent of um, uh, people from Black, Asian, and ethnic minority backgrounds were uh, were um, unemployed, compared to um, just under four percent um, of of their white counterparts. So uh, quite a significant variation, and you can see the breakdown of the different um, different groups there. So in particular, with uh, black groups, it's eight percent, um, and then Bangladeshi and Pakistani as well. Um, I touched earlier on uh, the fact that uh, black Asian and other other ethnic minority groups are fifty eight percent more likely to be unemployed than their white counterparts. So young people. Uh, so and that's just re really stark and we know we need to do more to tackle this uh, locally so, so these are national figures uh, so if we go on to the the next slide Rosie um, I just wanted to quickly touch on some of the more local data we have but up front I, I do want to say that um, we we have a significant data lag with um, local data we're dependent on um, more central resources to get that information on um, unemployment so that's why this lived experience piece is so important um, and so uh, what we have managed to hear is um, how we've had a higher proportion of black Asian and other ethnic minority groups um, accessing uni universal credit and job seekers allowance during this time and in addition to that, we've also had a higher proportion accessing advice services, so employment and finance advice services. So, so we know on the ground in Camden that um, people are, are seeking employment and financial support um, more so than, than their white counterparts. Um, so although we don't have the, um, all of the data on the unemployment, we're seeing some of that, that early information. Um, and, and just to quickly touch on what, what have we done so far. So in Camden, uh, we have a high proportion of people accessing apprenticeships and adult community learning opportunities. Um, and also we are, um, we, we do work with our um, different partners closely. So for example, the Jobs Hub, uh, we've been working with uh, the Caref Centre, the Somali Community Centre. Um, and Hopscotch, um, for ex just as an example of some of the organisations we've connected to, to ensure that people um, know what employment support is available for them and so that we can tailor that at a neighbourhood level uh, to ensure people have the right employment for them. And that, I think that's what's really key for Camden, it's ensuring people are in good work um, and, and working with communities to, to ensure that we, we can do that. Um, and just to touch on some of the work we've done during the pandemic. So of course, uh, some of the earlier figures showed that um, a lot of our BAME groups are, are in um, sh the shutdown sector, what we're calling the shutdown sector. So those high risk sectors like uh, uh, hospitality, uh, construction, for example. So we've been sharing that public information, uh, public health information, to local businesses to enable safe working environments uh, for people who are going back to work uh, now. So really taking that health, health angle and supporting our businesses from that perspective. Um, I'm mindful of time, um, but we will share, share these slides um, after this. Um, and um, just touching on some of the, the work that we'll be doing going forward, working uh, with uh, from a youth safety perspective perspective and tailoring employment support for, for young people who may be at risk of um, committing crime or um, victims of but also pop-up business school uh, which I think is also important 
in respect of um, a lot, we have a lot of young people, being young people who want to set up their own businesses, they want to um, do things themselves. So uh, the pop-up business school is an approach to intensive training to helping them start up those businesses and uh, without borrowing money. Um, and we're looking at um, rolling out uh, a pop-up business school in September. So again we need to work on our communications and ensure that everyone on this call is receiving that and knows that it's available and, it, and, and is able to share those in that information with residents so that we can um, uh, ensure that as, ma as many BAME, um, BAME people are accessing um, that sort of support so um, I'll, I'll leave it there just in, in the spirit of time um, I'm not sure if we have time to take any more questions but um i can always share so we've got a, an email address set up um where we're keen to hear people's feedback um and again we will uh, touching on a point that was raised earlier we will directly send this report to everyone that has attended today um so that we can ensure that um you are involved and you you know what some of the next steps are going to be and you can help us uh, shape shape that going forward Great, thanks, Penny, for that. Um, so, uh, any any quick questions? We've probably just got time for um, a couple of quick questions. If anyone, I've got um, Lena. You've got your hand up. Um, go ahead. Maybe it was for the second time, but I was. Uh, it, I skipped something in terms of education, and thank you so much for all the updated. Um, and uh, information for us to follow up and see better results in future. But in the website of the council, have further support and advices. There is a section where because I really who struggle financially a lot. Uh, they can uh, use laptops and me, but there are no proper section where uh, uh, voluntary sector who has that to ask and refer and do a um, request for the families and their because they are not able, they don't have enough support from the schools. I would really appreciate if you extremely hard with this vulnerable family who has, especially the language barrier, uh, if you can do further collaboration with our organization and order nation and being collaborative together is not in relation to funding, which is um, extremely important. Did you hear? Lena, that was, you were breaking up a little, but I think you made an interesting point that it isn't just about funding, that it's um, collaborating with organizations uh, as well as just about the funding. Uh, I think that's an important one. Yeah, with yeah. Hannah, I am extremely, really, I do support her too much and really, with love to hear in the future further support and funding but further collaboration with the voluntary sector where they work too hard and they really they are really able to be in direct direct contact with those families because a lot of barriers are broken in a way it would be a good opportunity to work in future together and improve the lifestyle of these of our client our people our communities and thank you so much anyway Great, thank you for that. Now, um, if, uh, if Benny or Bal, if you want to respond and then I'll, I'll wind up, because yes, we're running out of time. Hi, so um, I, I missed a lot of that, so I'm really sorry, Lena. Um, so it may, it may be helpful to pick it up offline, but just on the collaboration point, um, uh, we, we definitely want to, to take forward uh, collaboration. So um, I think maybe if I can provide uh, my contact details to Kevin, uh, we can definitely have a conversation with that, um, if that's helpful. 
Great. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. That's been really interesting. And it now um, falls to me to, to try and summarize. So I, I think it's, it, it, we are going to um, produce some uh, summary of today, but just the things that have really struck me is that some things, uh, I think somebody said that health inequalities were, were nothing new. Um, the, some issues like the, the, the digital issue, the interpreters, um, and I think that um, Rafat's revolution about BAME organizations being commissioned, the, that these things really uh, hit a nerve. And I think for me, something that was really came out was this problem about local intelligence versus um, the data that um, the public sector is comfortable with. And I, I think you'll, you won't be surprised to hear that uh, we network with our colleagues across sister organizations across the country. And, and this has been a real issue right across the country that, that um, the local organizations have, have seen what's happened straight away and have tried to give that local intelligence to the public sector and the public sector then is in a difficult because they like good solid data and to them some of our data seems a bit anecdotal and then you have this tension between what what can be you know what can be trusted and i think it comes down to having a, a good relationship between the local sector and the, the public sector so that um, people can make judgments about what we feel is is our intelligence that we're, we're seeing what's happening on the ground so that that one really um, resonated with me now in terms of taking this forward it's really important that we we, um, we don't let this drop that we take it forward so um, and, and VAC, we've been working on this area of health inequalities for some time. So we're, we're really keen on this. And we will pledge to take this forward uh, with VCS organizations and we will uh, do what we can to facilitate. I've, I've talked to a few organizations um, and uh, Health Watch, of course. And so we will put out a call for organizations who um, want to be involved our role will just be to facilitate um, and we will make sure that the vcs uh, takes this work forward and we will do what we can uh, in terms of practical things our next vcs forum we are going to dedicate to bain funding so we've already talked to a couple of funders we've talked to the Bailey network and so that uh, forum on the 15th of July is going to be dedicated to uh, BAME organization funding. Um, other suggestions that have come up, uh, I think it came up today, it's come up before, and that's this idea of um, partnership working, maybe larger organizations partnering with smaller BAME organizations. Uh, that's come up, so we will try and uh, organize a session, uh, a forum in the future on, on that issue as well. Um, but I think the, the most important one is uh, some sort of uh, forum that, that takes this issue forward. So if you want to be involved in that, um, please do get in touch. So I'd like to thank uh, Benny and Bao in particular uh, thank you very much for coming and presenting and the work that you've done on this. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone behind the scenes uh, from the council and from VAC. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you very much for coming and taking part. Uh, please do, if you didn't get a chance to say what you wanted to say, pop it in the chat uh, and then we will uh, make, we will read that. Uh, and put something together. I think we are one minute over time. So thank you all very much. I will end the meeting at that point. <laughs>